Thank you, and um, uh, I've just uh, moved my family back from India and over the last couple of years. I uh, was incredibly fortunate to spend a significant amount of time with innumerable TB patients in a variety of Indian healthcare facilities. And I, and I learned an enormous amount uh, about the realities of, of being poor and sick, and, and I saw firsthand the uh, the way in which undiagnosed and mistreated patients are, are driving an epidemic of increasingly drug-resistant TB. In those encounters, I, uh, I came to learn that those people who have, end up actually have this remarkable list of lame excuses for why they don't get diagnosed. They don't perceive cough as a symptom. They don't think of fever and chills as, as abnormal. And they'll, they'll, they'll have these uh, symptoms for, for weeks or even months before seeking care. And, and even once they admit that, they, that they're not well, uh, they'll waste additional weeks or months medicating and self-denial. And so consequently, by the time they're diagnosed, all too often they've already infected their family and friends. <coughs> Only in retrospect did I realize that while living in India, I had become one of them. As an asthmatic, cough is a, is a part of daily life, and it, it was pretty reasonable of me to treat six weeks of increasing cough with 10 days of steroids. As an ID doc, it was not totally unreasonable for me to then, when I failed to get any durable relief, to take three days of outdated uh, azithromycin that I found in my closet. And who, amongst, who, who doesn't find themselves drenched in sweat when it's 112 degrees outside? Uh, and, and who among us living busy lives uh, actually takes time to go see a doctor? And it was only after several months of, of, uh, of this that when my office mate, Puneet Dewan, jokingly referred to me taking my usual morning chug of cough medicine, that I, I came to grips with the reality that I was actually, by every critical criteria, a TB suspect. And then, what, in a bizarre psychological twist, I spent the most miserable weekend not con actually convinced, not in denial, but convinced that I had XDRTB that I must have acquired in, in my visits to Mumbai. <clears throat> But you know, what, what actually did distinguish me from the roughly 100 million uh, people who will need to get tested for uh, chest symptoms this year is that I had the knowledge and the resources uh, so that I could get a definitive evaluation in 17 minutes. Because within a couple of kilometers, my office was uh, an outlet of, for one of India's major lab service providers who had joined IPACT, which is this growing movement of laboratories who are committed to providing affordable and quality assured diagnostics at a reasonable price in India. And, and, and 17 minutes was exactly what it took me from the time I walked in to submit a speed assessment to get a digital chest x-ray, for which I, I paid far less than I did for the tank of petrol to fill up my car on the way home. And, you know, fortunate for me, uh, my test results were negative. My, my symptoms were indeed uh, just caused by my asthmatic lungs trying to cope with the Delhi smog. But, but it was for me a really, really moving and personal experience and the example of the power of diagnostic certainty. Um, it was particularly gratifying since I've been fortunate to have uh, had a front row seat in the last decade as TB product development has really undergone a transformation a decade in which many people, and many of you I can see in this room today, uh, have transformed TB product development from what was most generously described as a stagnant backwater uh, to an industry that will enable millions of chest symptomatics to get better diagnosis and, and patients to get better care. In fact, it, it, was, it was really an amazing decade looking back on it, and, and uh, there are the efforts of so many people that I know at the outset that I'm not going to mention most of you, and so let me start by apologizing to you folks who I'm not going to mention. When I look back, I'm, uh, I'm mostly struck uh, 
by how easy it is to forget just how desperate we were 10 years ago. In 2003, the TV community was frankly still pretty comfortable uh, with the AFB smear. The TV diagnostics industry was, well, the diagnostics industry was, was incredibly skeptical. I think mean, heroic efforts by Vivian, Genpro, Broche, and others to develop PCR tests had met with limited uptake, and they were not anxious to jump back into the game. When I talked to investors in Sand Hill Road, they were frankly hostile, telling me it's a good thing we're friends or the door would be hitting you in the backside. And, and, and there was little in the way of diagnostic sciences. I'd sat on the study sections where in every single diagnostic program proposal was just too boring to fund. In drugs, the situation was not much better. If I remember correctly, the only really identified large pharma company was GSK, where Ken Duncan was running a program on TV drugs. Uh, most big pharma companies were doing nothing, and a few others, uh, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Novartis, were running what, what would be best described as skunk work projects. At that time, Partners in Health and Gail Castle at, uh, at Lilly were, were voices in the wilderness about uh, the need to pay attention to treat drug resistance TB and the need for better drugs. But, but the one other characteristic that these two fields shared was that they were caught in a death spiral. They were, it was a vicious cycle that was spiraling down and down, one in which there were no resources for R&D. And so without resources, there were no young scientists coming into the field. And with no scientists and no resources, there were no good ideas to move forward. And even if you wanted to move them forward, because there was no thing to move forward. Industry hadn't thought about how you'd move it forward if you could. Because they, they could see no pathway to a return on those investments. And because of that, they weren't investing, which, which gets us back to the fact that there were no resources and the whole spiral repeated over and over. And TV product development, drugs and diagnostics was, was just a moribund field. I think in the last decade, there's been a sea change in this field. I think in TV, <clears throat> I would credit the start of it uh, to around 2000, which if I remember correctly is when, um, maybe it was 2001, when Mark Perkins and Carlos Morel applied to the Gates Foundation for a $10 million grant to TDR. It was somewhat ironically 11 years ago this month that Mark and Giorgio sketched out on a napkin uh, at a Stop TV partnership meeting in Montreal uh, on diagnostic economics, uh, the plan that became a find, and it was equally remarkable with six months later that the foundation was able to award a grant of $21 million uh, after being scrutinized by Bill himself, who wrote me a two-page single-spaced email about it. In the drugs, it was, uh, I, I think, I would say the seas began to change around the year 2000 when Ariel Babo Mendes, the then at Rockefeller in South Africa, started the social movement that was, uh, was, was the Global Alliance. And I think under Maria Ferrer's leadership, it gained financial support from a number of different donors. And when she hired Mel and, and a number of other people, turned it uh, from a uh, dream into a, a credible uh, drug company. In the ensuing years, uh, both Maria and Giorgio pursued fundamentally the same basic strategy. The first thing they would did was to try and drum up some support for new tools. I, I remember more trips to odd places where the partnership board meetings were held, and every time someone said "Dots Maria" or, or uh, Giorgio or Maria would shoot up their hand and say "and new tools," and 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 in the process began to transformation in, in, in the mindset of the TV community. They, they built these organizations, which I think have, uh, have had from their outset as their goal to drive uh, passion, their passion, and, but not to be the sole players. It was more about reaching out to this full spectrum of stakeholders, domain experts, donors, advocates, uh, to try and put together uh, a, a real product development uh, opportunity. And, 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 and to pursue those strategies, they really used the, the same tac tactics. I mean, the first step was to step in and, 
and, and, and to try and, and define the market and to segment that market. You know, for find, it's the famous triangle, which we've all seen so many times. Uh, for the alliance, it was the pipeline of, of, uh, of, of, of diagnostics, which has become, I think, equally cliche. They, they then brought in the technical experts to, to, to do some real landscaping, to find out what was the portfolio of activities which were actually possible. And they transitioned a hodgepodge of small one-off projects and grants into a manageable industry-style portfolio and, and worked with others, and many of you whom I see in the room, uh, to create pathways uh, forward. You know, Mario and the WHO, uh, a pathway for diagnostics endorsement and the Stop TB partnership uh, to implore the Global Fund and Unitaid to actually purchase the, the fruits of, of all of your labors and, and, uh, and the advocates uh, to push for, for their adoption. And in those intervening years of, of what was frankly hard and frequently discouraging work, something really magical happened. And that was that this vicious cycle flipped into a virtuous cycle. One in which, um, as documented by Mark Harrington and TAG, resources started to flow in, increasing resources from, from industry and, and governments, uh, you know, significantly the National Institute of Health, the EDCTP, and others. And, and with that money came talent, uh, TV meetings, which literally could have been held in the back of a minivan, were suddenly filling rooms with hundreds of, of, of fresh young faces. STAG uh, process was developed, which created a clear pathway uh, to uptake in the Global Fund and National TV program managers uh, become well-defined markets. And, and all of these changes were under the watchful eye and the inimitable prodding of the activist community who, who ensured that, that, these, uh, that these visions were not constrained uh, and were unfettered by compromise. And, and, and so, so when I look back, I, I feel as though the field has, has made this shift and, and, and looking at the future, I, I feel like we're well into it already. I, we're, we're already seeing some of the, the fruits of, those, of that virtuous cycle. Uh, I would say this union meeting itself has transformed in that technology has gone from something that people were skeptical about to being one of the major drivers of change and discussion. Uh, the gene expert, for example, which Jan Gewens calls an imperfect transformational technology, uh, has stimulated all sorts of, of discussions and, and, and um, there's, there'll be a steady march of, of, of different and bigger diagnostics to follow. Uh, you know, big tech in India, U-Star in China, Kaijin Alir, and it's just, I, I, there's tremendous uh, opportunities. Uh, and, and, and I think we're also going to see, we're seeing the resurgence of some old technology. I was, you know, really shocked to find that in some of the smallest towns that I visited in India, you could get a digital x-ray read by a certified teleradiologist within four hours for less than two bucks. So we have to start rethinking how old technologies come into play with these new technologies. And, uh, and, and in drugs, I, I think, if I understand it correctly, the next three months in TB drug development will be as, as exciting as any three months that I can think of in the history of TV drug development with the phase three results from Remox, the phase two results from PAMZ. But in the end, I don't think that the future will be about technology. It's, it's about how improved technologies get integrated into evolving systems, which I would envision as occurring in the context of six principles. <coughs> the first is, is that the future will be built upon the basic lessons of DOTS. Uh, in particular, good record keeping and the focus on adherence. But this will be leveraged by information and communication technology revolution that, that seems to have happened under our noses and left us entirely behind. I mean, imagine truly integrated systems that link diagnosis to reporting, to adherence, to patient management, to supply chain, and also to incentives, rewards, and payments. 
I su suspect that advances in IT in the next five years will be the single biggest uh, and radical, most radical change, and, and I'm a little surprised how little discussion we've, we've seen of it in these last few days. Maybe it's coming next week. I think secondly, um, in the future, we'll have to acknowledge that one size fits none, and uh, that there are different suites of intervention that are appropriate to different epidemics. The, the HIV community has talked about know your epidemic. I mean, it applies equally well to TB. Third is, and particularly relevant to this uh, session, is that going forward, uh, we need to trans transition away from accepting empiricism and demand certainty. Uh, we can no longer accept the presence of visible bacteria in a microscope uh, as evidence of disease and then just use the patients as a bioassay for drug resistance. Uh, I think we will move forward we will come to a place where we will know who has TB. We will know ahead of time what drugs that organism is susceptible. And we'll use it from the start. And, and, and people say, well, that would be expensive. But you know, I wonder how much of that cost. You're just front loading. And there will be savings because the expensive and laborious microbiologic monitoring, for example, I suspect will become less relevant. Fourth is, <clears throat> if we haven't already, we need to get over saying that we know what to do, we just need to do it. We don't know what to do. I mean, we do know how to get started, but if we don't get smarter every day and construct our programs around that learning as well as the service that they provide, then we will not outrun this epidemic. And then finally, in this, uh, this globalized world, I think that the high burden countries uh, will stop looking to Geneva or Washington or London or wherever for solutions, but that they will invest in their own capacity to, to answer their own uh, and solve their own problems. So, so I, and I'm actually quite often, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, most of you know me know that, but I, I'm, in this case I think my optimism has some reality base. Uh, and that the future is in fact quite bright, that we will uh, start to move beyond just uh, treating patients before they die and start to promptly diagnose, appropriately treat, and interrupt transmission and start bending down uh, the epidemic curve. So, so let, me, let me close by saying that I'm, I'm not oblivious to the fact that we are far from out of the woods and, and I think the, the most sobering message that has come out of this meeting that I'm aware of is the TAG report, which shows that, uh, that, that, uh, that enthusiasm may be waning and that funds may be leveling off. This will kill everything. This will undo and set us back into a vicious cycle faster, uh, faster than just about anything else that's possible. But I, I mean, barring that, then you know, I think we do have some wind in our sails. And, and, and I think this is a fantastic session today because we need to stop thinking about diagnostics, and, and, and we need to stop thinking about drugs, and we need to start thinking about the two of them as, as sort of two sides of the same coin, or however you want to think of it, but because it's, it's about diagnosing and treating and linking those together and that's going to have impact for our patients and for product development, aligning these product development uh, pipelines such that when you come out with your new intervention, there's a suitable uh, diagnostic test to go with it. And I think that, that this uh, session is a really important step in that direction and uh, look forward to, to, to hearing the other presentations. So thank you. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, so if anybody has any questions, please uh, step up to any of the microphones um, while anybody's thinking of those. So Peter, I certainly share and, and appreciate the optimism. Um, but what do you see, though, as perhaps the biggest one or two challenges, or if you had a crystal ball and could change the world yourself um, over the next couple of years and, and just wish some one or two things to happen, what, what would those be? Well, it's fragile, right? That's our big challenge. It's, it's all fragile. All it's going to take is for one of these big studies to go down the the tubes and, and, and people, all the naysayers will jump right back into where they were a decade ago 
gleefully telling us that they, they told us so. So I think that the biggest challenge is just to maintain momentum when the dynamics have started to shift, but that we don't really have a robust enough pipeline in drugs, and we don't have a robust enough pipeline in diagnostics, uh, and we don't have enough uh, resources to, to move even what we have forward. So the, the biggest risk is, is, is just the fragility of this. Um, if there aren't any other questions for now, then...